everybody. I hope you've liked the brownies and the burritos and all the great food. And uh, to everybody who's attending remotely or watching this session afterwards, I hope you've made yourself some fab lunch. Uh, so today we're looking at building AI powered web apps. So we're looking at Python as a great general purpose language that we can use to make a difference. Uh, today, as I said, we have Akuya Appiajay, our apprentice here at Microsoft, who's presenting from the past. Deepa, who's joining me remotely. Uh, she's a cloud solution architect. And hi, everyone. I'm Steph. Uh, I run a team of cloud solution architects and AI and software and data and really, OK, anything tech even optimization and bus timetables is my passion. So we're going to be talking today for about 45 minutes and hopefully get you ready to build some awesome apps. I'm going to do a quick intro. So uh, there are a lot of buzzwords on the slide. What's Flask? What's an app? We're going to cover that. We're then going to see how a queer set up her development environment. So if you've not coded before, or you've not coded in Python, what do you need to do to get started? That'll be her first steps today. Uh, then Deepa is going to take you through Flask, so you can understand this great framework for building applications. And then I'm going to round off the session uh, talking about AI and how we can integrate that into our application. So it's a game of three parts. This is not a Python tutorial. Uh, we only have 45 minutes. So unfortunately, I can't teach you all the things as much as I would like to. I just want to upfront that this is not a guarantee to be a web dev or an AI engineer. But we have tons of links at the end, and I absolutely love giving people homework. So your homework is going to be reading like all six links that we give you, uh, which includes like whole websites. So have fun. OK, let's take you in and deep dive into uh, building an application with Flask. So if you haven't built uh, applications before, you're going to need a few things. The first is an Azure subscription. So if we want to be able to use AI that Microsoft have built, so you don't have to, if you want to be able to host your application, Azure is a great place to do it. Most of you might already be aware of it, but some of you might not have personal subscriptions. So if you don't have a subscription, which is basically an account in the cloud, you can get one uh, as a free trial. Or if you're a student, you can get one uh, as part of your student program. The great thing about what we're doing today is we're going to be using the translator cognitive service, and that is free for up to 2 million characters per month. So really, unless you're trying to kind of repeatedly translate war and peace, this isn't going to cost you uh, a penny to do. You're going to need Python. Uh, the links on here and the slide deck uh, will be available to you, and they're also in the instructions. Python installation varies by whether you have Mac, Windows, or Linux, and can vary significantly even amongst those operating systems. So I'm not going to be teaching you how to install Python. If you have questions, um, there is in the Flask AI tutorial link, that also has the link to the Python install instructions, and you can work through it at your own pace. If it doesn't go right, it might take you a little while. And then finally, VS Code. Visual Studio Code works on Mac, Linux, and Windows, and enables us to be able to work with uh, code from all different areas of programming. So that's what you need to be able to do this at home uh, and on your own time. And by the end of this, you're going to understand how to get your Flask development environment up and running. So how do you get everything uh, kind of going to be able to build an app? 
can see how we build an application with Flask. And then finally, how Translator, the, uh, the AI solution, can be integrated to be able to perform tasks for you. As I said, lots of homework, lots of links at the end of this for some of the detail on this. So we are going to be building an application with artificial intelligence. It sounds really fancy, really super futuristic, um, but it doesn't actually have to use a lot of coding knowledge um, or even you know, being a machine learning engineer. Our goal, and particularly at Microsoft, is to make these futuristic techs easy to use and easy for you to make an impact. So whether that's you want something that organizes and categorizes shoes, or you want to be able to track underwater divers, you can do all of these things, including building your own Babel fish with AI. And Microsoft's online tools help you do that without you needing to have a lot of expertise and knowledge in those areas. OK, so we're close to seeing Aquia's first start, and this is what you'll be going through um, when you know if you do this at home. So we're going to first of all get our development environment, our project workspace up and running. So the how to. First of all, make sure you have Python. Make sure you have Visual Studio Code. Once you've done that, you need a workspace for your app to live in because we're making files. So you're going to create a project directory. And then we're going to add a Python virtual environment. Code is complicated. There's lots of packages and uh, libraries out there which do lots of different things, and they all update at different speeds. So we use basically virtual environments as sandboxes to put copies of what we're using into spaces so that we don't break all the other stuff that we built. This means you don't have to try and uninstall things and reinstall it when things invariably go wrong. Uh, so we're going to create that virtual environment. And then we're going to add Flask and anything else we might need into that uh, virtual environment or sandbox so that we can get started. So let's look at Aquia's journey. So first of all, always a good idea to make sure you have Python installed and available. It's just a quick check. Then we make our environment, so uh, our workspace. So that's the MD Contoso. And then we can set a virtual environment up with Python uh, then uh, as the step. What this is going to do is inside our Contoso directory, basically set up that Python, in a little slice of Python and all the packages needed so that we're ready to go. We then activate it to say this set is what we need. And then we can actually start building stuff. So inside code, which you can access through code space dot, is a great way to open up code, VS Code. We can then make our requirements.txt. Requirements.txt is basically your shopping list of packages. So we're going to be able to write out what we need. Once we've done that, we can then say, hey, Python, go and install all these things for me. What's really handy, because you know, you'll start building an app and you'll grow it over time, is you don't have to get everything right first time. If uh, you forget a package, you can always come along and do this step of Python install requirements.txt again uh, and again and again. So you can be agile about how you build things. And that's it. So this gives us everything we need to be able to build a Flask application. We have Python up and running. We have a safe sandbox to work in. We've got a workspace. And that workspace has all the packages that we need to be able to get the job done. So with uh, following along a quiz example, uh, we're now ready to move into building Flask. 
before we do that, I'm going to hand over to Deepa, and Deepa is going to tell you what is this thing called Flask that I keep talking about, and then show you the next steps. So over to you, Deepa. Thank you, Steph. Thanks for that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Deepa Shinde. I'm Cloud Solutions Architect at Digital and App Innovation Team at Microsoft UK. It's the same team that Steph um, works in. Uh, as part of my role, I help customers to realize their vision through various technologies and really empower them throughout the journey to do things on their own. In return, I learn a lot, of course. It's not just about tech, not just about various different uh, industries. There's a lot of innovation as well, so I really enjoy what I do. So just kind of um, joining some dots here. I'll just take a control here, Steph, okay? Yep. Great thing about hybrid work is that we can each share the same slide deck. Lovely. Yeah, so about Flask fundamentals, right? And uh, we are here to kind of build the web application in Flask. We're just a bit of fundamentals about web application itself. We uh, we know in web application, we have client server databases as a three tiered architecture. We talk a lot about front end and back end. Um, now, front end can be your UI, and it could be the pretty things that you see in the UI, and back end is more like a web server, which would take a request and process things for you and send it back to the client, which could be a web browser acting in uh, on, on your behalf, right? So, in terms of front end, there are various different uh, languages that are used to build the front end. You, we have HTML, CSS. JavaScript, likewise, you know, back end, there are so many uh, different languages like Python, Ruby, and, you know, name it, and we, we have lots of languages there. But again, you know, in terms of frameworks, there are many frameworks that could be used for both of these front end and back end uh, pieces. We have Node.js, there is React, and back, back end, we uh, have Django, which is on Python. Again, there is Flask, we have ASP.NET as well, and we're going to look at Flask particularly today. So let's get into it. Flask, as you know, as it says uh, says on the slide here, it's open source web micro framework. We are here to develop web applications, so we are looking at a web framework. What does micro means there? Micro means a light framework, right? It's not a full blown framework like Django. Um, Django is, Django has a lot of other elements that are needed in web application development, be it your object reference model, model, be it a lot of other pieces, right? That come along with your framework when you install the framework. Flask is not that. Flask is very lightweight for very you know small uh, scale applications. Um, and having said that, not that we can't add these elements. We can elements and uh, add these elements and extend the framework later. Uh, but Django, something like Django or frameworks like you know ASP.NET are more for um, applications which are enterprise scale big applications. What we are going to do today uh, for that Flask is apt, right? So. What we will do is we will kind of get to um, into Flask and understand a bit about what it is. Now, when we talk about any web application, right, there are certain uh, concepts that we need to talk about or we need to understand. Basically, one is routing, another is methods, and then there is templating. So this is like typical for any web application. Um, so let's look at routes, right? So I mean, let's take a step back and look at how we access a web application. What do we do? Generally, a website, right? We type in a URL or we click on a URL, right? And that URL is nothing but uniform resource locator. And the very first link there kind of tells you what kind of link it would be. It could be google.com, it can be amazon.com, microsoft.com, right? We have adventureswork.com. So that's like your, that's that's your URL. But anything after that, that comes after that URL, which is on the second link, if you see products slash widget, right? That's kind of, um, that's kind of defining a route to your, to your web server. It kind of tells web server, what action or where does it want to go? What do you want to see on the on 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 the web page, right? Uh, likewise, we have a third example there, right? So routes are basically just an additional information after your main host name that would tell web server where you want to go and potentially what you want to do. Yeah. So let's get into methods and we'll talk about routes again when we are talking about methods right methods or verbs are nothing but the way in which you access the routes right when you access route you kind of pass on information about your state about your state in the sense about your browser state and what you want to what action do you want to perform now there are two common verbs or methods that are generally used get and post there are many but 
like for today, we have just 45 minutes as Steph said, and we have to finish everything. We're just going to talk about get and post, right? So get and post are two methods that we are going to talk about today. As the name suggests, get is something which will tell web browser that you're get you're here to kind of get some information. And post is nothing, but you're here to perform some action and get response for that action. Uh, so on a typical website, right? Let's say if you are submitting a form, a feedback form, let's say, you would either click on a link or type the URL of the website, and that tells the web browser that you are doing a get because you just want to get to the root host name of the website. The initial part is the host name, right, of the web part of the web, of the web, web application, and that's where you want to go, and that's a get. And the next part, which is post, is more like when you are submitting the actual feedback and you're clicking on a button and you're sending the data to the web server, right? So it's more like when you're browsing, it's get. When you're doing some action, performing some action, typically a button click, it's a post. Yeah. And this flow, yeah, we just spoke about this flow. We there's a client which is your web browser, it's kind of representing you. Then there's a server which is waiting to take take the request. Um, you send a request over an internet, it goes to your web server. When you typically go to a root of the website, it's a get request. Server understands it's a get request. Um, it kind of sends the HTML back onto your browser and browser understands HTML. Uh, when you're filling up the form and submitting the information, it's a post that goes into uh, into the server. The information is processed on the server side and you get the HTML back. You get the response back either saying, you know, yes, your feedback has been submitted. Thank you for doing so. Right. So this is what this kind of flow depicts. It's a typical web application flow. This slide is all about how we do routes and how we call methods in Flask. And let's not, I'm not going to go into deep on this slide now because we have a code to look at and we can probably talk about that more when we when we get there. But if you just look at it at high level, right? You're you're defining a route on app saying if it's a root uh, route or if it's an index route, which is just the host header, right? Just adventureworks.com. And if it's a get, then call index function. And there's a function at the bottom there, right? Which says index. And what is index doing? It's not doing much but returning a template, which is index or HTML. It's a HTML file. And we will kind of talk about what templates are in, on the next slide. And likewise, if you see post, right? It's doing the same, you know? When the post is done, a render template is called render results.html. And a data is passed. The data that you have put on the form is passed to the web browser to do some processing and to get back the response. So let's move on to templates, right? And what are templates? Um, hypertext markup language, which is HTML, is a language that you use to structure information on your browser. That is, again, supported with uh, cascading style sheets, which is CSS, to kind of prettify your, your web page and to make it, look, uh, make, make it look nice. But HTML, as most of us know, is very static, right? But if you look at any web application, there are a lot of dynamic elements on, on the web application, on the page of web application. So if I go to, let's say, Amazon, right? It tells me, it welcomes me saying, you know, welcome Deepa. So it's like a dynamic text that's been added to the web page. And how do you do that? How do you do that? You do that via templating. How do you define those dynamic elements? And that's what templates, uh, templates are basically. So every web framework would have a templating engine to do this, to replace these placeholders. And name here, which you see, is a, is a placeholder, right? That needs to be replaced. For Flask, we have Jinja, which is a templating engine. And Jinja understands HTML. It looks for the placeholders, replaces placeholder, and that's the job that Jinja performs for us, right? So this one typical, as I said, you know, those curly, two curly open and close braces kind of tell Jinja, right, this is a placeholder. You need to kind of, you know, replace this at the runtime depending on, on the state of the of the session or of the of the application. So yeah, that's this is the fun part now. We are getting into what we all like to see, which is a demo of creating an app. Uh, all the concepts that we learned or that we went through just now, we will try and apply those here. And remember that um, that file or that page that talked about how we do the routing and how we do how we, how we call method. We'll look at that closely uh, when we get here. OK, and all this is on the learn module. No, I mean, everything is there and you can follow the learn modulizers and you should reach uh, to the to the right destination. Um, what we are going to do is we are going to, as part of this, we are going to create 
core application. So you have already set up, right? Steph has already set you up here. What we are going to do is take next steps, which is write the core application, define routes, create HTML template, and then the most important piece is testing. Anything that you do in small pieces, always take it to a logical end and test it. And of course, along with this, all we all who are developer know how important source control is and how important check in check out is. So like for, for developers, these two pieces are really, really important. So I'm going to stop the video a bit. Akriya has done a great job in creating these videos and we are, we are going to take you through it. But let's talk a bit about this page and what you see on here, right? So we are picking up from where Steph left us. We have our project ready. You should see PyCache, VN, folder and requirements or text in your fold uh, in your uh, project basically and what we're going to do now is we're going to create app.py and what is app.py app.py basically is a starting engine for for flask by default that's the file which you would use to kind of start that's the entry point basically for the flask application you can change it of course and there are ways to kind of uh, inform flask that i want to change it to welcome.py and there are commands to do that and you, know, you can look into it and uh, can can read about it but what we, what I'm going to do is kind of quickly tell you, I mean, this is more about, you know, you will create app.py file. And then on this page, the code that you see is kind of importing Flask and some of the other elements like render, uh, render template, which you're going to see afterwards. And really at the bottom, you see the same code, right? Which we looked on that slide, which was all about routing and, um, you know, using methods. So it kind of tells us here that there is a route on the index which is get, and if that is called, then call the render HTML, index.html, right? Uh, again, for some of you, right, who are doing this for the first time, and, or maybe are using Python for the first time on your uh, VS code, you might get some warnings, right? You know, install this package or install that package. PyLint is one that you will be always, you know, told about. And PyLint is nothing but is a linting um, uh, tool that is used for Python. It's great because it kind of tells you, uh, it's kind of static code analysis, right? Nothing, nothing more than that, but it kind of helps you to write best practice and good code with a good, you know, standards. So do definitely install that and it will, it will definitely, you know, make a difference. So now let's start the video and see what Aquia does. Right. So yo, we talked about this. She is now going to go and create a templates folder because we all know Flask needs templates folder uh, for creating or storing any templates. So the standard name is templates folder. She's creating a file under it called as index.html because that's what our route needs, right? And she's going to copy paste the code from the learn module here. So let me just stop this again. And just talk through the code a bit, right? So this is your HTML uh, code, and what you see here are some of the important elements, right? You see text area. You must also see the option, which is more like a drop down, right? And then there's a button. And it, on the form, if you see, there's a post method as well. Okay. So button, generally, wherever you have button, there's an action. There's that's post, right? So when the form loads, it's generally is going to load the HTML elements, and it's more going to be a get. And it's going to load this form basically, right? So if you look at the look at what we have on the on the form itself, when you think about a typical translation page, and that's what Steph is going to take us. She's going to help us to glue this with the translation uh, service in the back end, right? But on the form, if you envision this, you're going to have a text box within which you're going to type the text that you want to translate. You're going to have a drop down where you're going to say, I, I have to use this language. I want to translate in this language and hit a button. That's what this form is, uh, you know, doing. So I'm going to start it again now. Just here, right at the, at the top, you should see uh, like various elements, right? We are calling bootstrap as well. And now what is bootstrap? Bootstrap is nothing but it's again, um, it's again a library that helps you to do uh, beautification. It helps you to do device management um, of your form so that you can use your form on either, you know, mobile device or on the laptop or on the, um, uh, you know, any of the device for that matter, tablet for that matter, right? But if you don't know about Bootstrap, that's fine because it is doing nothing else but kind of prettifying your, uh, your, your form basically. That's the HTML. 
the QA is starting a new terminal because we have to deploy our Flask application now. So the first thing she does is she's going to set the Flask environment to development, and that really helps us to kind of uh, you know uh, render the code that code changes that we make on the code basically. And remember where I said you could have um, you could have your engine changed as well. There's a, there's a command called as set flask underscore app equal to welcome.py. That will tell flask that you are changing from app.py to welcome.py. Okay, that, that's what you'll have to do. Let me start this again. And now we do flask run and that runs, that brings our website name here. I mean, address here basically. If you see the port is 500, okay, I clicked on that and it brings the translation service. You would type in the text here, select the language, hit the translate button, which would tell, which would tell your web server that you, are doing, you have done a post and you want to call another page. So I'll pass it on to Steph to integrate this with the translation service and see the end-to-end -end piece. Thank you. Over to you, Steph. Awesome. Thank you very much, Akuya. Uh, Xavier, can I have the power, please? <laughs> um, so we're now going to start looking at uh, translation. So how are we going to be able to, in real time, do something that you know we might expect from like Google or Bing Translate? So the slides will catch up with me. Um, but uh, when we do translation, what we're actually doing is processing uh, it internally. If we're mentally translating things, we're taking one known system of language and trying to map that to an entirely different structure. And it's actually really complicated. Yeah, non-native English speakers are amazing for being able to do this translation in their minds and be able to communicate really effectively. And one of our biggest challenges in artificial intelligence has been replicating this capability because there's thousands of words. There's intonation, there's uh, contractions, mutations, all sorts of things make language a, uh, and both spoken and written a really tough thing. So uh, this has been an area where we're doing um, a lot of work in Microsoft and in you know, Google Translate and stuff. We're working on it. Victoria, are you able to give me control from your side of things? My button's disabled. So language translation, super hard. Some of you might have been, you know, if any of you are language buffs, you might have seen things like uh, BERT and different pieces where we try and do language translation using computers. The great thing is, with a lot of what Microsoft has been doing, is you don't have to understand how to do that translation yourself. Microsoft is making easy to use APIs, which are computer consumable resources available to us on a pay as you go solution. So that if you want to, um, uh, Tig uh, was talking about in university building, uh, tracking underwater divers, great for a safety thing. And you know, if you're a, uh, if your company's in marine sciences and things, super important. Microsoft basically has an app for that. We have computer uh, custom vision where we can make things happen. Uh, my request button needs to be enabled. Okay. Thank you. So uh, th there's an app for that. There's a translation app. There's an app that makes us be able to do smart search. There is an app for even deciding how should content be ordered on a page to help people get the most value. For us today, we're doing the translation piece uh, and we're going to be able to translate. And I think they're up to about 192 languages now or 162. 
and maybe 30 out either way. Uh, most importantly for me, they do Welsh. <laughs> um, but they, they have a wide range of languages, including uh, not just Latin-based uh, languages, so you can do Cyrillic or um, uh, different types of alphabets. So the translator service is what we're going to use. I'm still a couple slides behind. I might. There we go. Thank you. Magic is happening. Uh, so. I'm driving it, Steph. So just instruct me and I'll ah, click brilliant. the next button. Yeah. You, you know the flow deeper, so you'll keep up. Um, OK, so we're going to be able to make one of these resources on Microsoft. But as I mentioned, it's pay as you go. So if it's pay as you go and you just like let it hang out in the open in public, then other people could use your app and rack up a bunch of charges for you. That's not my idea of fun. So we need to add some security. And we do that basically with a password for our online API. We have a key that our app will be able to send to Azure to say, hey, I'm making this request and I'm legit. Please give me some results. So uh, as a best practice, because that key and utilization of it can cost you money, don't put that in public places. OK, so we're going to quick. We're going to show a key uh, part in part of a queer's demo and you won't be able to use it because we've already gone. No, that would be too insecure. Uh, so this is just a best practice. Don't don't like put that key on Twitter. Also, don't put credit card photos of your new credit card and things on Twitter. That also is not a good idea. OK, so let's start. Uh, I think we're next up with Aquia, and we're going to be able to do this live, um, be able to see it integrate. So the first step is going into Azure, making your own API for translation, and then adding the details so your Python app knows how to use that to communicate to Azure. So we're now going to uh, do that. We're going to watch Aquia do that step by step. If you press play deeper. So following the tutorial, it very nicely gives you the code to be able to do this command. Uh, and we're doing a post command, so we're sending some information, which is going to be the text that we want translated and the language we want it translated to. And we're going to send that to the internet, to our Azure environment to be able to do stuff. So we need to do a post because we're posting data somewhere. And then when that happens, we're going to take some information from our form. We're going to take some values from what will be an environment ver uh, file, so something local that contains our password. And then we're going to be able to bundle up that information to a URL, be able to get a response back, and then present that back to the user by injecting it into our HTML uh, template. Deepa, can you press play? Or is it stuck? I guess it's working slowly. You know, we did dress rehearsals and all sorts. It's always the way. I once practically had to do the Macarena when uh, my laptop stopped entirely presenting and ended up with somebody volunteering from the audience to work their Mac to help me deliver my session. Uh, so we're now, we, we need to store a password uh, and location of our translator app. We do that in a .env file. You do not put this into source control because if your project is public, you're putting your password for a chargeable, potentially chargeable service on the internet. Bad idea. So once we've got that .env, we're then going to be able to do stuff. 
let me restart it. I think it is um, it's just stuck, right? So let me just go back to the previous slide and come back. Because I think we're missing our solution creation. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to start it from the beginning, Deepa? You should do that if um, if it lets me actually it's not letting me drag <laughs> for some reason I don't know why it's stuck mm. yeah I think it is let me start that again now let's see okay no it seems to be stuck Steph oh well um Aquia did a brilliant job but my video editing on Windows 11 might not have been so great last night after testing PowerPoint compatibility with PowerPoint Live. Um, so to be, create the resource, uh, what you need to do is go to portal.azia.com and type in translator. You can create the resource. You can put it in a logical container to keep all your stuff together so you know where to find it. You can say where you want it located. Great for making sure that you comply with GDPR and other uh, important regulatory considerations. You can set a pricing tier. Great for us, there's a free tier to start with. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's 2 million characters per month for free translated. So we can do that in a work context it's got network and security pieces so you can make sure that uh, only people on a certain network can access it um, and add tags for compliance and controls and things like that once you do that you are then able to access all these key pieces of information uh, and once this is done we should then be able to do our uh, call of the translator service. So Deepa, if you're able to move us to the next slide. So we've already had a sneak peek of the Python code, the Flask code needed to do this, but we're going to call the service with a post request. We're going to create the template, uh, the like the index.html to be able to show the results. And then as Deepa mentioned, we're going to test it because we should test step as we go along, step by step, to make sure we've done things right and haven't broken things. So let's move uh, to watch a queer do this. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, yep. Yeah. Because it looks a lot like the old video. So a uh, queer was able to post in, uh, the, paste in the content from the tutorial. And that includes the post step, it constructs the URL and sends the data from the form. Now it seems to be stuck actually. Stuck. Uh, jump ahead like 30 seconds. Yeah, I've done that. Too. Can you see the changes? There we go. Awesome. Yes. So uh, this is what the template looks like um for when we get a response back we don't want to show the the text box and the submit button because we've already done that so we need to present back the results and we're able to provide the original text with the curly brackets or braces around the uh, bit that's going to be injected the translation from the api and what language we coded it in uh, we, we requested just because, you know, memories are short. And then we're actually being able to go back to our translator page by not just being able to say a variable, uh, a parameter name in our templating, but also something dynamic to say, get the URL for the index page, because it might be in some way a little bit more complicated. Uh, so once we have the app.py with the post, and we have, uh, yeah, maybe if you're able to bounce it a little bit back and press play. It's 
it's not letting me go back actually for whatever reason. OK, no matter where I press, it just kind of keeps the same. Yeah, 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 we go. Ah, there we go. OK, so uh, Aquia typed congratulations, you did it. Uh, which we did. So then she was able to press the translate button uh, after using the drop down to select Russian and be able to then get the text and get the Cyrillic uh, based Russian statement. Anybody know Russian and can confirm our statement? No? Yeah. Yes. Does it work? Yeah. It's yeah. Pretty good for, it's more difficult for small complex statements. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. And we, we also made sure not to use any idioms or kind of phrases like putting the horse before the cart, because that kind <laughs> of thing doesn't necessarily translate well. So that is us being able to uh, translate stuff. Thank you for Sola, for Solia. Uh, I appreciate the confirmation. So uh, that is the process. And uh, Deepa, we also have a URL for an end-to-end -end video of all the steps as well. So you'll be yeah. able to see them. Uh, we'll share that um, with people. Uh, I'll tweet it and things like that. Um, but you will also be able to do this yourself. So you can do this at aka.ms Flask AI tutorial. It provides step-by-step -step instructions and includes the links to installing Python and Visual Studio Code. So you can go from nothing on your machine to being able to build an app with AI in about an hour barring, you know, complexities of quirks on your machine for installing Python. So today, you know, you've learned what it takes to build a website. So you need something that takes values and pushes it back to people. You need some presentation tier. And you've also looked at AI for how AI can be used to add value. There is tons of different ways that AI can add value inside your uh, domain. You can also custom train many of these things to be specific. So if you work in financial services or manufacturing or government, you can make things that work for you and you can make them securely and safely as well. Uh, and most importantly for AI and the idea it's my heart, you can do it responsibly and ethically. So you've learned a lot. Please do give us feedback, like make the videos work. Uh, that, you know, very valid feedback. Tell us how you liked it. This kind of session is, uh, you know, can be considered quite new. So if we want more, if you want more like it at future builds, do provide that feedback. And I did say about homework. So here's your homework. <laughs> Once you build your app, Get it live, get it in production, show your family and friends. Um, you can also use what we've learned today in lots of different domains. So you can hook it up to your IoT enabled toaster and node red and uh, do all sorts of cool things. You can create machine learning models. And if you're inspired to learn more about Flask and Python, we have some great content to help you learn Flask. Uh, and uh, learn Python. So plenty of homework, hopefully something for everyone there. And one last plug, most of this stuff is on microsoft.com slash learn. Learn is a place that you can become a tech awesome genius for free. You do not have to go get a degree. You do not have to pay lots of folks like me for training. You can forge your own path learn as much or as little as you want. And it really is truly a great site with lots of brilliant people contributing to help give you uh, an awesome tech journey in all sorts of areas. So thank you all very much for coming today. I think we have time for one question uh, delivered live. Um, hopefully questions about life, the universe and everything. Um, but Andy, do we have any questions? There's lots of love for Flask on the channel. Um, 
and I, I think that it went really well. There hasn't been there that many direct questions, but mm -hmm. uh, I thought I'd maybe chip in and, and ask you. Yep, one. ask a doozy. Yeah. So um, this is this is great, and what you've got there is um, is a fantastic introduction to how Flask works and and how you can get that feedback from the user and then push it across to like an Azure service. Mm -hmm. um, you started talking about getting that app deployed onto. Yeah. On, onto Azure and you had a few secrets around there. Maybe you could just mm -hmm. comment about when you do deploy that out to Azure, where do those secrets go? What do you do with those things to keep everything nice and safe? Brilliant. So the question around where do you put your secrets on the internet securely? Uh, so there are a number of options that you can start with. The simplest one, when you deploy this into what we very nicely call Azure App Service, because you're hosting your apps, you can add it as a configuration value. So you can add it as a secret directly in the app. That works. That's how we've been doing things for a long time. It is not the most secure way. So Azure has something called Key Vault, and it stores keys securely and safely. So we can add our secret passwords to Key Vault and then authorize our app service and our app to specifically talk to it to be able to extract that secret safely. So it can it stays all encrypted and it is much more difficult for somebody to access that password, that key. So that is kind of simple on the app. There's a configuration page. And next level up, super whizzy, super cool, is Azure Key Vault. OK, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, keep an eye out on the MS Build hashtag on Twitter and LinkedIn. We will share the full video and the slides and the recording and everything will be in your session backpack. So you can come back to this and the link at any time over the next, I think, year and be able to do this yourselves. Thank you all. And thank you, Deepa and Aquia, for being amazing today. Thank you.